Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker. Now, let me tell you something else I observed about life, viewing it from my hearse. Now, you listen to this country undertaker because I'm just to tell you the truth. In this world, you're going to have trouble. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how young you are. I don't care if you live in Chicago or Reynolds, Georgia. I don't care if you're white, black, yellow, or green. Things ain't going to always go your way. Now, I got to tell you, I've observed that viewing life from my hearse. But I've also read about that in the Bible. It's in John chapter 16. You can look that up. Jesus himself said it. In this world, you will have trouble. He didn't say you might. He said you would. Okay, I have got with me today uh, a longtime friend of mine. Her name is Rena Bowden from Dublin, Georgia. And this story is not one of those stories that is easy to tell because on June the 25th, 1998, that was 23 and a half years ago, Rena's precious little daughter, who was five years old, Sarah Caitlin Bowden, passed from this life to her heavenly home. It was devastating to Rena. It was devastating to Rena's husband, Jim, Caitlin's daddy. And it was devastating to their other three children. And it was devastating to all of us who knew them and loved them. For me, it was one of those times as a funeral director that I never forgot. And I believe there are people here that need to hear their story. I, I think there, there are people out there that have been through the loss of a child and are really struggling, and they need to hear from a mama that has been through that and is 23, over 23 years past it. There, there are those who possibly could go through the loss of a child. You may be in the middle of the illness of a child, and those are many of us that have never gone through it, and we're thanking God and praying to God that we never have to go through it. But it's also for all of us who have experienced trouble uh, in our lives. That happens to every one of us. In this world, we will have trouble. So, Rena, first, thank you for being brave enough to get on this podcast with me. I did not hesitate to call you because I know you so well, and we've got a bond that goes back longer than the 23 and a half years, but it certainly changed 23 and a half years ago. My memory is one day you called me and asked me if I would meet you at the First Baptist Church in Butler, where we both were, both of our families were members there, and would meet there with our pastor, uh, Steve Miller. Uh, you needed prayer. And I don't think you told me why. So take it from there and tell us what was going on, Rena. All right. It's an honor to be with you today, Bruce. I, th I thank you for just entrusting me with um, sharing my testimony. Um, yes, our daughter was about four and a half years old. She was our fourth uh, child. We had uh, twin boys who were about 17, almost 17 years old at the time. And we had a daughter, Laura, who was um, about 12. So Caitlin was kind of our bonus baby. We were all crazy about her. She had never been sick. She had never even been to a doctor. But when she was about four and a half years old in October of 1997, she began having some symptoms that could be attributed to a lot of different things. She began to um, stumble a little bit when she walked. Uh, she would cry and tell me she didn't know why she was crying. Um, she even threw up one time. I thought she had an ear infection. Um, but I became uh, alarmed enough. Um, I was, I just was scared. And so um, I we took her to the doctor uh, for the first time in her life. She went, went to a doctor and we had a, an excellent family doctor and he was, he took enough time to really examine her. And when he looked in her eyes, he saw something that apparently um, alarmed him. So he scheduled a 
a CAT scan at the medical center in Macon for later that week. So um, when we got home from the doctor's office, I, um, I called Steve at our church in Butler and asked him, I said, I don't know what you think about this, but the Bible says that when anyone is sick, that the elders were to gather and anoint with oil. And I said, would you be willing to do that? He said, I sure would. And so he gathered up Steve Skidmore, who was our worship leader as well. And then I called you and I said, Bruce, do you have time to meet us at the church to pray for Caitlin? And your response was, honey, I'll make time. And so into the car we went, it was about a 25 minute drive. We got to the church and we gathered on the floor in Steve's office and you and Steve Miller and Steve Skidmore um, laid hands and anointed her, laid hands on her and anointed her with oil. And then by the time I got home, there was a, a call back from the doctor who said, this CAT scan is scheduled for tomorrow morning. So be there. Um, so we got there and not, while I was waiting on the CAT scan, um, our youth pastor, Jonathan Winningham came in and he was the one who was there with me when the results came back and that it was a brain tumor. It was located in the third ventricle, which is the center of her brain. And um, it was very devastating news. Well, Steve Miller was on his way to, I think, Marietta to a pastor's conference. When Jonathan called Steve, he immediately turned around and came back. This is the importance of the church family. This is why the Lord put us together as a body, because we need each other so desperately. So he came back to the hospital and he and Jonathan uh, were with me as soon as Jim was able to get off work. Of course, he was there and, and the boys and I began to make phone calls and Caitlin was alarmed um, about what was happening because we were um, all of a sudden kind of in a cycle of busyness and she said mama what does this mean and I said honey I think it means that you're going to get a lot of teddy bears a lot of balloons mm. and I told her I said I will not leave you and that immediately set her at ease that day was um, just very ripping because we kept getting uh, more knees people kept showing up um, by the end of that day um, there must have been 25 or 30 people lining the hospital room where we were. And the pediatric neurologist there had talked to us about um, what was going on. He explained that the tumor was blocking the spinal, the flow of spinal fluid through her brain and that was causing her um, symptoms. So he was going to do a surgery that would create a detour around it and cause the spinal fluid to flow as it should. And sure enough, uh, when he did that surgery, uh, she was back to normal. Uh, she wouldn't have thought there was anything even wrong with her. But we were standing in that um, hospital room and so many people surrounding us. And that's when I think I first kind of lost everything and um, just went in the bathroom and just kind of fell apart. And I remember Wanda Queen was right there sitting on the floor of the bathroom, just sobbing with me. Um, a longtime prayer partner of mine showed up. Her husband um, saw Jim and how helpless and absolutely uh, out of control of the situation that he was. He, he, he likes to fix things and there was just nothing he could do. And he took on the job of praying Jim through this whole situation. I was so thankful for that. So how long was it, Rena, uh, that you you guys ended up in Memphis at St. Jude's? How long? Well, it was just, this was in November. She was diagnosed on November the 11th of 1997. Um, after this um, first initial um, ventricular um, detour that they did, 
um, they allowed us to stay home for Christmas, which was um, a wonderful thing. Although it's very hard to watch your child open her Christmas presents when you know it could be her last Christmas. But her surgery was scheduled at Le Bonheur Children's Hospital in Memphis on December the 30th. We spent Christmas Eve there. And that's when um, Dr. Sanders, who they told us was one of the maybe three doctors in the world who could successfully remove this particular kind of tumor in this location. He did the surgery, it was successful. She was in ICU for three days. Um, I was able to stay with her if I broke a few rules and um, I, I didn't sleep at all for those 72 hours. I remember that um, saying for the first time, my child has brain cancer. Okay. Well, um, we spent three weeks in Memphis uh, they did the surgery at Le Bonheur and they immediately then sent us over to St. Jude for treatment. But while we were at Le Bonheur, which is an old, old children's hospital, um, those were some very dark days. Um, very dark. It was, it was even dark outside. It was raining and it was just terrible. And I remember that you called me and that I, in that room right after we were out of ICU and I was absolutely at the bottom. And you called me up and you said, honey, I'm praying for you. And I said, well, you can just stop because it's not working. And your response was, right now, your faith is weak, but mine is strong. And that's when I learned, Bruce, that, that scripture that says that we're to pray for one another. Oftentimes it means you pray instead of that person in a, in a situation where they're not able to pray for themselves. I remember talking to you and I remember that conversation. And I know we talked several times. And then as you move forward, you, you go through all that. And then in June, you, you're back at the medical center in Macon. And uh, what was the news then? What was going on? Because I remember coming to visit you at the medical center. And I want to tell you, I didn't visit people that were really sick at anywhere in the hospital. Uh, I just didn't do that as a funeral director. You, you, people look up and say, what are you doing here? That's <laughs> just something I didn't do. But y you were different. And I remember coming uh, to the medical center, and uh, it was not good. In fact, probably a couple of weeks before she passed away, right? Yes, we um, we spent several weeks uh, in Memphis. We also spent several weeks in Houston for um, some experimental treatment that did not work. Um, during that time, I was pretty lost in um, in all the worry and all the not knowing and just the uh, scariness of it. And I remember another thing that she reminded me of, and that was a, a song that the Gaithers sang called, We Have This Moment to Hold in Our Hands and to Touch as It Slips Through Our Fingers Like Sand. And you brought me back to my senses that I, I had to stop worrying about what was going to happen and enjoy the moments that I had with my child and my children because I had three other children who were equally devastated and, and, and their daddy. She was such a daddy's girl. So we get to about May and the tumor has returned. Very aggressive cancer, medulloblastoma is what they called it. Very aggressive cancer. We knew the tumor had returned. I was alone in the hospital with her one night about midnight. And everybody else had already gone home and I was on my knees on that hard floor and I was praying. And I literally let go of God. I said, Lord, we have asked. We have done everything your word says. There are people all over this world praying. And, and I knew she was dying. And I, I literally let go of God that night. But what I knew then was that he did not let go of me. 
It was never about my holding on to him. It was about him holding on to me. And for the next month, as we went through the horror of it, of her, the process of her dying, that was what I had to hold on to. Now, I know that not every funeral director can be as close to every family. We were so very blessed to have you and Kathy and Mac, who was um, our pastor for so many years, your brother, who taught me so much about the Bible when we were at church together. Um, all of y'all and Steve and Lori Ann Stidmore were right there every day, every day. My other dear prayer partner, Terry Bennett, she would come to the hospital and she couldn't come where I was because she had a little girl of her own that was a year younger than Caitlin. Let me tell you what, what my perspective was and when you ended up back at the hospital and I came over there and that had to be somewhere around June the 15th. And the reason I know that, it was a monumental time in my life because uh, I had sold my funeral homes the year earlier in October of 97 is when I sold them, but this other company had just acquired the company that I sold to. So on June the 15th is when I became part of SCI, which would, uh, for the next 23 years, would be my career that I never dreamed I would be doing. I've been all over the country doing what I learned to do in Reynolds and Roberta, Georgia. And I've had a, I'm retired now, but I've had a wonderful career. But I remember vividly visiting with you guys and in that deep, hurt room and with Caitlin in there, knowing that she didn't have time, and my beeper went off, and I had a number to call. So I have to go, and that's back when you find a phone booth, and I called, and it was a guy by the name of Bob Clark who would be my boss for the next three or four years that became a very good friend of mine that he was telling me, welcome to SCI. And the reason I'm telling you that is because in just a couple of weeks from then, she passed away. And so I, I really was working for this big company and I, they had me doing other stuff, but I had, and I had other people to take care of uh, funerals and making removals and stuff. But I, I was, there was no way I could walk off and leave what you were going to. And I remember going to, I had to speak at a convention in Amelia Island, which was at least a four and a half hour drive, probably five hours from Reynolds where I lived. And I was struggling that day because you had, she was back home and, and you knew she didn't have time and much time. And I was trying to figure out what to do. I had, it was a big convention. I was committed to it for eight months. So I drove to Amelia Island and I got there and I prayed that nothing would happen and not that somebody else couldn't have gone to pick up Caitlin. I understand that. But I wanted, to, I wanted to be there for you. And so I spoke at this convention, and then I was, had a beautiful room at the Ritz in Amelia Island right on the water. I got up at 5 o'clock the next morning and drove back, and I got back before that happened. I don't remember what time it happened, but I remember coming to your house and, and, and knowing that she was dying, but thanking God that I got back there uh, that I could be there for you. And I'll never forget what happened that day. I remember that day. We, um, we took her home on June the 24th of 1998, which happened to be my birthday. Um, the doctors, doctors sometimes don't know when to stop. And I had to say, you know, it's time for us to go home. Caitlin wanted to go home. And so we took her home and we were greeted by a house full of wonderful friends and family um, that we had that one last night at home. And Thursday uh, at 1230 in the afternoon, and I went back, I was in the bedroom with her, and I noticed that her breathing was different. So I got up in the, on the bed, and I got her in my arms, and she breathed um, her last breath here and her first breath in heaven. Mm. And she died just very, very peacefully. And I didn't understand about, you know, where you were. I, I didn't know any of that. All I knew was you weren't around close by 
but it didn't take long for whoever to get you there. I remember you had a request for me that, that I've never had before and never had since, but you asked me, Bruce, please don't bring the stretcher in. Uh, please uh, take her out to the hearse. And so I picked Caitlin up when we got ready to leave. I'd been there a while. And I walked outside with Caitlin's lifeless body in my arms. And I'll never forget, as I was walking to the back of the hearse, but a couple was walking up. And they stopped in their tracks. I can't imagine what they thought. I don't remember who it is, but I can promise you whoever that was had never forgotten that scene with me walking out with, with Caitlin's lifeless body. And, and what I was thinking as, as your friend and as a funeral director, that this was like my little girl. I was treating her just like she was mine, and I was going to take care of the physical body, although we knew she was in heaven the physical body of your child was very important to you at that moment and that she be treated uh, uh, the way you wanted her to be treated. Oh, yes. And let me back up just a, just a little bit. When you came in and I was on the bed holding her and, of course, sobbing and people were beginning to gather, you did not immediately try to take her from me. You just sat down on the bed with, with us and you just put your arm around me and you said you can hold her as long as you want to. And you were so patient. And, and I knew that you were going to have to take her. But you said, honey, I'm going to take good care of her. And you did. You did. And I knew you would. Because I got a phone call not long after you had gone back to the funeral home with her. And you told me that you had polished her fingernails. You put her in a little Easter dress. And you had washed her hair. And I knew that had to be so hard. But what, what it meant to me that you loved my child like your own. And you loved us as Christ loves his church. That, that is the ministry that brought us through and showed us Jesus the whole time. And yes, it was hard to let her go. But I was able to release her into your hands. And that, that meant so much for all of us in the family. Rena, I also remember, and listen, you're bringing back stuff to me that it gives me chills to hear. I mean, you got to understand, whatever I've done in my career, what you're talking about is what I was put on earth to do, to walk into those situations that you just described. That's what I was created to do. And uh, I've done a lot of other stuff, but that's what I was created to do. So... It, it, it's a blessing to hear you say that. But then we, let's talk about the funeral. And I remember several things about that. It was a huge crowd at the First Baptist Church of Butler. And tell me about that. How important was that to you, that whole situation with all the people that came that were standing outside and whatever, everywhere? Well, I, I wondered, I, I remember wondering, I wonder how many hugs that I, I will I have this day. And there must have been hundreds, hundreds of people just hugging me. And I needed every single one. I needed every person who was there because it wasn't just family and friends and church, um, church family. It was her doctors, her nurses, uh, some, of, some of the, just the, all the caretakers that had been present in so much of a ministry to us during all of those months when she was sick. Everybody that I needed was there. And there was that little pink co uh, coffin at the front of the church. And inside the top of the, of the casket, there was an angel embroidered on it. And that also meant so much to me. Mm. Now, the day that she died, um, she died at 12.30 in the afternoon. By Before midnight, I just sat down at my typewriter, and the Lord gave me just um, the words to spell out on the, on the computer um, as a tribute to her because I felt like all the people who loved us deserved to know 
what we had been through and how much their presence there had meant to us. And so that's what I read at her funeral. Um, uh, and, I, and this thing you said about um, her body being so important. Yes, and so many people said, well, she's not here. She's not really in the, in the coffin. She's with Jesus. That is true. But this is the body that I gave birth to. This is the body that I bathed. I held her hand. I, I knew her smell. I had heard this little body say, I love you, mommy, many, many, many times. That little body was so very important to me. And I've thought about that and thought about that over the years. And I think it's true also of God's son. When Jesus went to the cross, there came a time when God said, it's enough. He has suffered enough. And at that point, he sent people who took very careful care of his body. They, they got him down from the cross. They held it. They wrapped it. They put the spices on it. They laid it in the tomb. That body is very important. Our physical bodies are very important to God. And I think it's important for people to understand, yes, her spirit, her soul is with Jesus immediately. But that little body is, is so also so sacred. That moment of death is a sacred moment when a believer passes from this life into that realm. That is, is really true. One of the things that you told me about and that when she was dying and she was told you, this was in, the, I think you at the medical center, but she, she told you she was ready to go home and you you knew that was she was not talking about Roberta. She was about talking about home, home. Tell me kind of how that transpired, because I know you called me when that was going on. Yes. Yes, I, I must have called you 500 times, and you always answered the phone. Um, and so did everybody else. So Kathy was there to read stories to Caitlin. Oh, it was just amazing, the, the love and the support that we had. But... When she was in the hospital, she'd just come out of a four-day coma. And when she woke up from the coma, she was in quite a lot of pain because the radiation, the chemotherapy had so damaged her liver that it was not functioning very much anymore. She was in quite a bit of pain. So it was a production for the nurses to help me get her out of the bed and into my arms. And they put, brought a rocking chair there, piled it up with pillows, and I was able to rock her. And I, I would talk to her and she could talk to me. And I said, are you ready to go home? And she, yes, yes, mommy. But I knew that both of us were not talking about our home. And Roberta, we were talking about heaven. And I wanted to tell her about heaven. But for the life of me, the only thing I could remember in all the scripture that I knew was the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And so I called you. And I told you what had happened, and you just began, open your mouth and began to quote um, Revelation 21 and 22, um, where we learned so much about heaven, such a beautiful description of heaven. We don't have to wonder what heaven is like. The Bible tells us. And uh, you even quoted that at her funeral. I remember, I remember, and remember somebody standing out front, and I remember who it was, but they came up to me and said, Bruce, you memorized that for today. And I think they were right. Um, and I want to say, too, this, this happened right before the funeral began. We were at the church already, and um, I was standing at the back, and you were there, and uh, so our family was there. And you said to me, you said, David, your son, David, who was probably 19 or 20 then, David wants to pay for the funeral. And I immediately began to protest, of course. And, and you said to me, no, he wants to do this and I want you to let him do it. And I tell you that has been the best blessing for this young man who loved my family who loved my sons, who were uh, close to the same age, to 
to love us so much that he wanted to offer this such a special gift. And he so, paid for our baby's funeral. And he did. And the story with that is that we had a friend, uh, Bucky, who was in the, he was flipping land and he, he, of course, friend of the family. And he got David as a teenager to, to call people who were landowners and he was flipping and he told him if he made a deal, he would get a percentage of whatever he made. And he, David got somebody on the phone and they made a deal and David got a fat check about the time all that was happening. He did volunteer to do that. And I, I never forgot it. And I know he hasn't ever forgotten it. And it was a, it was a blessing to me too. I can tell you that. The, the other thing, Rena, as, as we move through, uh, I remember leaving the cemetery and we had to drive all the way to Dublin, which is hour and a half or whatever it is from Reynolds or from Butler or maybe two hours. And we go through the committal service and I've been with many families leaving that scene. And I remember how difficult that was for you that day. I remember it was heart wrenching as you kept looking back at that cemetery. What are your, what are your memories of that? I don't really remember anything about the service around the cemetery. I don't remember much of anything. But Jim and I got in the in the car with you, and you were going to take us over to the house. And I remember how hard it was to leave my baby at that cemetery and to know that she was about to be buried under the ground. It was so hard to let go of that little precious body. But you were there and you were just, all you did really was acknowledge that you understood that, that devastation. You know, Rena, but let me tell you, I really did not understand. One, early in my career, I, I had a man that was, that was murdered and I was at the scene and his grown son, a lot of people gathered after a while and the grown son came up. I was probably 21 years old. And he came up, said, man, I am so sorry. I know how you feel. And he looked at me with fire in his eyes and said, you have no idea how I feel. And I never said that again. And the truth is, I, I can't know how you felt. There are other people that have been through what you've been through that know how you felt, but I can't know that. And uh, all I can do is, yes, acknowledge that you're hurting. And I felt so sorry for you, but I cannot say I know what you've been through. And that brings me to this, this whole, I know that in the last 23 years, your ministry, part of it, has been in this, this scripture in, sec, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, it says, He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. And what I've seen in this business is that when somebody's going through something like a loss of a child, or it could be a loss of a husband or a loss of a wife or a loss of a grandchild, who, whatever it is, when a person walks in that has been through that, they immediately look at them. They have their undivided attention because they have survived this. My own mother, her father died when she was 13 years old. And I remember any time we had a teenager that lost a parent, Mama was the first one to the funeral home or to the house to go talk to those people because she had lived through it and she had immediate, immediate credibility because she'd lived through it. And they knew somehow you survived and you're still thriving in life. And they're wondering, like you wondered when Caitlin passed away, if you'd ever be normal again, if you would ever be able to keep your head above water again. And you have done that, obviously. There's no telling how many people you have touched in the last 23 and a half years by people that are walking through. It doesn't have to be the exact thing, but walking through trouble, being comforted by God, still surviving many years later, and being able to touch and help people has been your life's work. Am I right? And I've never asked you that in my life, but I think that's true. Yes. Um, well, I, first of all, I want to say that it has not been a uh, an easy process. It's been very very messy. I, I don't like people to think of me as some kind of paragon of faith. Um, most of the, a lot of the time I have been just a puddle, but I have begged the Lord to use me until I'm used up. And so about a year after um, Caitlin's death, we moved to Dublin 
And three months after we moved to Dublin, my, my father passed away also in my arms. Um, so where our life just seemed to be about death there for a, a, a while. Um, but I have had the privilege of being able to minister to many families who have children who are ill or are just death in their family. Um, uh, I've been with a number of families, even at the moment of the passing of their loved ones. And I have learned that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. For believers, it is a sacred, precious, holy moment. And to be able to turn the attention of the family to that eternal perspective has been such a privilege. But that is what he has taught me as he emptied me and then he was able to fill me with what he wanted to do in my life and not just what I wanted to do. I had always been so active with children and teaching children. And for a while after Caitlin's death, I, I just couldn't do that. But it wasn't very long before the Lord made very clear that he wanted me to be back in children's ministry and not just teaching them, but leading the children's ministry. And I did that for um, about 20 years at the church we were in here in Dublin. Um, and then about the year 2000, um, I began to teach Bible, offer Bible studies for some ladies. And over the years of, of doing that year round, um, he's just brought several hundred, about a thousand ladies over the years um, in about the 50 or so Bible studies that we have done uh, on a regular basis. And there's nobody out there who's not hurting. Would you say that your healing came in giving to others? Is that how you got through this after 23 years later? Uh, you, you didn't get in the ditch and hover and put your head over, but at some point, at some, it didn't happen immediately. And you were mad, you were upset, you were a human being. But at some point, you got yourself up, you dusted yourself off, and you began to give yourself away. And in the giving yourself, the giving of yourself away, you began to have healing and perspective into what happened. Is, is that fair? That's fair. And it's what Jesus did. So when we give of ourselves to others, we bring glory to him. And that's ultimately our purpose for being here. And, and that's our healing when we go through trouble. On Caitlin's grave mark in Dublin, on her grave marker in, in Dublin, Georgia, it, you've got the verse, uh, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And uh, I know that uh, heaven is different to you now with Caitlin there. And I know your parents are there, but with Caitlin there, heaven is different for you. Well, one of the things that I learned, I, I started looking at this when my dad died and many years later, and I, I know that that the, uh, I think Peter, he didn't mean to, for us to take this literally, but he says, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, or a thousand years like a day. I did the math on that for my dad. And I, I did it just a while ago for, for Caitlin. She's been, uh, she's 23 and a half years just with that math, with that a, a day being a thousand years, she's been in heaven 32 minutes to her. She hadn't had time to watch one episode of I Love Lucy on TV yet. <laughs> and it's not like she's sitting there 23 years waiting on my mama and wondering what's going on. It's been like nothing to her. And if you live another 30 years, it's going to be 30 more minutes or whatever it is. And and it's nothing to her and she's fine and uh but i know that perspective can can be helpful to people as well uh but one thing's for sure uh your story is a powerful one and i know you've touched a lot of people when your daughter your five-year-old daughter is in heaven and she would be 28 years old today uh that takes on new meaning doesn't it rena by our comfort is in heaven and in the knowledge of heaven.
Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first earth and the first heaven had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Then he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. But to the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderous, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high. And I saw the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, with twelve angels at the gates. On the gates were written the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and three on the west. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel I talked to had a measuring rod of gold used to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city was laid out like a square. It was as long as it was wide. He measured the city with a rod and found it to be 1,400 miles long and as wide as it high as it was long. He measured its wall and it was 200 feet thick by man's measurement, which the angel was using. The wall was made of jasper and the city of pure gold as pure as glass. The foundations of the city wall were decorated with every kind of precious jewel. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth cornelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh junket, the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls, and each gate was made of a single pearl and the street of the city was of pure gold, like transparent glass. I didn't see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there is no night there. The glory and the honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, and they will see His face, and His name will be written on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and forever. The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. 
I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard them and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had shown them to me. But he said, Do not do it, for I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and all those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Then he told me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, because the time is near. Let him who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let him who is vile continue to be vile. Let him who does right continue to do right. And let him who is holy continue to be holy. Behold, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me. I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, so they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter into the gates and into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and offspring of David and the bright morning star. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes any words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come. Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Viewing life from a hearse, it could be worse. Laugh, think, and cry with the country undertaker.